Back to South Africa tonight, let's return to Wednesday's budget and concern is being raised over how government is going to be able to juggle this particular budget. Uh, Professor Andre Rue is with us from the University of Stellenbosch's Business School and he says he doesn't think that uh, the finance minister, Tito Ambueni, has too much uh, wiggle room. Professor Rue, good evening to you and uh, welcome. Put very simply, you're also quoted as saying that the country's economy is in injury time. If that's the case, how much time do we have left? Left until the end of the game, until the final whistle blows. Yes, well, I suppose we could use all kinds of metaphors and cliches, yellow cars, maybe. But um, when I say the economy is in, in the injury time, it's not so much about the economy, but the government's imperative to really start addressing the government debt that one of your earlier speakers very clearly mentioned. Um, so. Fifteen years ago, the debt ratio was barely 26% of GDP, is now racing beyond 60%. Now, debt in its own right isn't necessarily a bad thing. If a government borrows a great deal of money to finance, let's say, infrastructure and good things, then it's acceptable. The problem is when you're borrowing money to pay the grocery account, when you're borrowing money to finance current spending, and that is where it becomes problematic. Uh, the, the injury time metaphor perhaps also refers to the looming sword, the sword of Damocles of, of, of Moody's, uh, possibly giving us the so-called junk bond rating. Professor, in that grocery basket then you would have two very big ticket items. One of them is SAA, the other one is ESCOM. What sort of tone then does the finance minister need to strike come Wednesday? Well, I think he needs to give us very clear... Uh, probably difficult, probably unpalatable plans as to how they're going to go about uh, turning, turning the tap off. Uh, and I must add that the 60% number of GDP that is quoted for our government debt actually excludes uh, the debt owed by the state-owned enterprises, for which government kind of stands, stands as, a, as a guarantor. That's actually excluded. So that exacerbates the problem, if anything else. Uh, any, any solution for any of those state-owned enterprises will be, of necessity, politically impalatable. We might expect some movement on individual tax, possibly even corporate tax, but what I'm also hearing tonight is a possible move on value-added tax again, and this would be, to use your word, very unpalatable. I'm afraid so. But it's one of those things, you know, uh, you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. Uh, we really can't afford... Uh, the debt to rise at any more than one or two percentage points. The tax revenue in terms of organic increase is virtually non-existent. I mean, the, uh, the amount of tax we can collect is clearly a function of the degree to which the economy is growing and is hardly growing at all. So if you're not going to uh, borrow more money or not too much, if your government spending expectations are still there, I mean, we're going to have to spend more money on certain key areas, then the only thing left that can give way is some increase in taxes. Not, not, uh, and I mean the tax rates. Now, again, politically, it would be difficult to imagine raising the taxes of poorer members of society. Uh, we'll obviously see the normal sun taxes going up, petrol, etc., and you'll get the normal polite tit of applause rippling through Parliament that we expect, but there won't be enough. So you're left with, well, corporate tax, but there, as it is, our corporates are fairly highly taxed. And this is the last thing we want to do if we are really serious about attracting any more investment. So you're left with various aspects of um, you know, personal income tax, the more affluent members of society, and then the VAT rate, the always controversial VAT rate. Now, that, the VAT rate was increased last year for the first time, oh, I think more than two decades. It's always been perceived to be politically unacceptable. Uh, it still is in many circles, but it does give you a fairly convenient source of 20 to 25 billion rand. Professor, just a final question. A little later on in this program, we'll be talking to a senior representative from Kasatu at the weekend, mm -hmm. angrily expressing its concern over the possible uh, trimming of the public sector wage bill, uh, talking about uh, the consequence of a recession and also uh, labor unrest. The question, I guess, is does government really have any choice in the long term? Mm -hmm. If, if I were to answer that question from a purely economically logical point of view, no, it has no choice. If I put on a slightly different cap and talk from a politician's point of view, uh, well, it is politically rather audacious, perhaps, 
and, 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 and difficult to contemplate that. So to, to summarize what I'm trying to say here, uh, we do need to trim down, we need to slim down probably the whole civil service, to be perfectly frank. Uh, but at the same time, we need to do so in such a way that we're able to find a balance between efficiency uh, and then equity. We can't ignore the imperatives of, of having some kind of equitable uh, deal in the country. And that is why I don't think I would ever want to be in the minister's <laughs> shoes. I think it is probably, it sounds like a cliche, the most difficult budget in the last 25 years. And um, I'm sure if he had his own way, he would probably introduce ooh, almost an austerity budget. But I don't think it's only his choice. One has to bear in mind the, the ongoing, I suppose, turbulence within the ruling party, the uncertainty that has to be accommodated. And perhaps as a final point, uh, I'm looking, I'm very curious to find out what is meant by the sovereign wealth fund and a state owned bank. Uh, I don't think the time is right for that. Professor Andrew from the University of Stellenbosch's Business School. Thank you.